to the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. This is God's word. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And many people have, have felt that those words echoed their experience. And they come from a, a poem called The Hound of Heaven. And I think David, who wrote our psalm tonight, Psalm 139, he would say those words echoed his experience too. He knew what it was like to be pursued by God. In the psalm we, we read, he put it like this, where can I go from your spirit? Verse 7, where can I flee from your presence? And this evening, as we look at Psalm 139, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to cover everything in this psalm. There's lots of different ways we could come at this psalm. We could think about, for example, we could think about the sanctity of life, couldn't we, from this psalm? We could think about how God knows all our hairs and all our days. And we could think about the doctrine, I guess, of creation, all kinds of ways we could think about this psalm, but I want to think about the doctrine of God's omnipresence. Omnipresence. God is omnipresent. And this is a psalm that introduces us to the God we can't escape. 
And it's a psalm that teaches us whoever we are, wherever we go, we can't get away from God's presence. And what I hope will happen tonight is you will start to feel, uh, as David teaches us, you'll start to feel what it's like to belong to a God like this. And when we lived in Edinburgh, the church that we, we went to um, it met in a building off Leith Walk. And if you know Edinburgh, you'll know that at the top of Leith Walk, there is there's a building called the Omni Center. And uh, I don't imagine that the owners of that building had the attributes of God in mind when they opened that uh, building. But if you know that the word Omni means all, well, it's easy to understand the name, the Omni Center. Uh, the Omni Center has lots of screens, it has lots of restaurants, it has a cinema, it has a gym, and it's one of these places you can go to and do everything. So you can eat whatever you want, you can watch whatever you want, you can lift as much as you want. It's uh, all sorts of things for all sorts of people kind of place. So when we say God is omnipresent, uh, we are saying that God is all present. God is fully present. We often talk about God being omnipotent, all powerful, or omniscient, all knowing. But this psalm, one of the things it teaches us is that God is omnipresent. And unlike human beings whose powers are limited, uh, who are restricted to a particular place, God is fully present. God is fully active, absolutely everywhere. And God does not have spatial dimensions, unlike human beings who can be hemmed in, verse 5. God fills heaven and earth. And David illustrates this in verses 7 to 12. We're going to focus in on verses 7 to 12 tonight. Uh, let me read it again as we look at it. Verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. I want us to look at this uh, section, and I want to show you three things. And then near the end, I want to try and apply this idea of God's omnipresence in three different ways. And one of the commentators, he calls this a summit, verses 7 to 12, a summit of Old Testament poetry. And I think it's easy to see why. David doesn't just tell you in one line that God is omnipresent. No, what he does is he stretches your imagination and he puts pictures in your mind to help you understand it. Here's the first one, here's the first contrast, and it's the contrast between height and depth. Height and depth, verse eight. I'm in the Psalm, David, he, he wouldn't have known about space travel, but what you need to do in this psalm is you need to imagine David with kind of Superman's powers blasting up to the heavens and exploding to the sky. And David says even if he did that, even if he somehow hovered above the clouds or passed through the atmosphere, David knows his God would still be there. And it would be the same if he plummeted down. And if he went right down, if he went down to the bottom of the sea, if he went down to the bottom of the ocean, even there, he says, he'd find the Lord. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. 
Um, you may know that Sheol was a place that uh, Jewish people believed everyone kind of went to after death. And it was a dark, shadowy, mysterious, um, underworld kind of place. We could call it the grave with a capital G. David knows that he has a God who won't let him go even when he enters death. So height and depth. Here's the second contrast though, verses 9 to 10, east and west. Or dawn and dusk. In verse 9, he speaks about the wings of the morning. And it's a lovely phrase, isn't it? He's thinking about the sunrise. And it comes up in the east. And the phrase, the uttermost parts of the sea, that's a, that's a synonym for the west. David is saying, even if I traveled that great arc from east to west, even if I went at the speed of light, even if I somehow got beyond the horizon, the God I have would still be there. The God I have would hold me fast. I can't outrun him. Now, this is what Jonah discovered, isn't it? Uh, and this is what Jacob discovered. In Genesis 28, he has a dream. God sends him a vision, and he sees a ladder, a ladder that goes from earth to heaven. And when he wakes up, he says, surely God is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And in many ways, the same is true for us. We may move house, we may move country, God will still be there. I think it's important to say even uh, mature Christians, even those who've known God's help in the past, they can feel out of sorts when they enter new circumstances. And it might be a new job. It might be a friendship that's been fractured. It might be some relatively small change. But things like that can be very unsettling, can't they? And even believers that look on the outside very, very steady, they need to know they have a God like this. So height and depth, east and west. Here's a third contrast, darkness and light. Look down at verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And when we were young, we, we loved to do the kind of thing that's probably banned now for health and safety reasons, uh, playing hide and seek in kind of pitch black conditions. And what would we do? We'd close all the curtains, we'd turn off all the lights, we'd find the best place to hide, and then what would we do? We'd scream our heads off when we got found, wouldn't we? But something different in view here, Derek Kidner, he suggests that the, the reference to darkness, it points to that desire we've had since Eden to hide, to hide from God. And in John 3, Jesus says that light has come into the world, but men love darkness. And there's something inside of all of us that, that wants to stay hidden. And we live in God's world, and yet we say to him, I want some privacy. I want a little corner of your creation that's just mine, that I don't, want, I don't really want you to interfere with. But when we seek that out, God just says, found you. There's no place to hide. Night is as day, darkness is as light. And I think there's actually a real encouragement for us here as Christians when we slip up. And um, sometimes when we sin, 
And I think quite often we, we feel there's kind of no way back. And rather than coming into the light, very often what happens is we retreat, don't we, into the darkness, into the shadows. We want to stay away from Jesus. We often feel really ashamed of things we've done. And the devil loves to keep us in that place. Now, the devil doesn't like when we confess. Now, we feel ashamed, but nothing can stop God's work in our lives. And as his people, we don't have to stay in the dark. So David, is, he's introducing us to, to our omnipresent God. He's telling us tonight, we have a God who won't be contained. He won't be boxed in. He's always at work. You can go up to the heavens. You can go down to the depths. You can go east to west. You can try and hide in the dark. But you can't get away from the omnipresent God. Now, I want to, I want to try and apply this doctrine in three ways, okay? It's a bit of a different sermon this evening. We're not going through the whole passage, as I said, but I want us to think about this doctrine now. What does it actually mean? God is omnipresent, great. Well, here's three ways we can respond to this, this wonderful truth. Here's the first. Enjoy your access. Enjoy your access. And there are certain buildings, aren't there? Um, maybe St. Peter's for some of us is one of them. There are certain buildings that are really special to us. And in one sense, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's very easy for us to view um, buildings, certain places as being particularly spiritual, isn't it? And um, sometimes people talk about, God, about praying for God's presence to fall in a Christian meeting. And I think we know what, we, what they mean, don't we? And sometimes people imagine that, that certain songs or, or worship leaders or ministers have some kind of special power to, to lead God's people into God's presence. But I think the truth of God's omnipresence, it challenges that, doesn't it? God's presence is not something we can channel. Now this psalm says we, can have, we have access to him whenever we need, wherever we go, and however we feel. And I think um, <clears throat> that last phrase, it might be the most important, it's easy for us to link God's presence with how we think we're doing spiritually, emotionally, or even physically. <clears throat> but you have as much access to God when you're sick as a dog as when you've spent 30 minutes in your Bible. And we can talk to him at any time and there are no restrictions. And we might be going through the mill and all we can really pray is, pray is help me. We might have lots to rejoice in and we just can't stop saying thank you. We might be battling with sin and all we feel we're ever saying to God is I'm sorry. But the wonderful truth is you are no closer to God in any one of those situations. God sees, God knows, he's there. Francis Schaeffer said, the God of the Bible is the God who is there. So enjoy your access. Secondly, embrace your limits. Embrace your limits. Uh, this is a point about acceptance. 
And I, I didn't own a mobile phone until I was 17. And it weighed about as much as a bag of sugar. And it had no internet access, it had no iTunes, it had no uh, Google Maps. I mean, how did we cope? All it could do was text and call when I turned it on. And yet you and I, we, we live in a culture today that is, well, we're constantly distracted. We're always struggling to focus on one thing. Someone has called it the age of distraction. And with, I don't know, WhatsApp, Facebook, TikTok, iPhones, email, Instagram, Twitter, news updates. It's so easy to see why, isn't it? And you and I can be sat on our sofa, but we can be like on the other side of the planet at the same time, can't we? And we often complain about this, but I think we love it. Because uh, all these devices, they can be very addictive, can't they? They can make us feel limitless. And on one device, I can communicate with a friend across the Atlantic. I can order dinner. I can airbrush a photograph. I can comment on a blog. I can book a train ticket. I can like a picture. And our phones get everywhere. They're in our pockets. They're beside our beds. They're in our bathrooms. They're on our dinner tables. They're in our cars. Someone has said Facebook was created to remind Christians that they do have time to read their Bibles. It's quite a rebuke, isn't it? And so often what seems so urgent is actually the enemy of what matters most. And it'd be, it'd be easy to be really prescriptive, like just get rid of your iPhone. I don't think that's the answer. Uh, but you and I, we can often try to be omnipresent. We can often try to do everything all the time, everywhere. We fill up all the space with triviality. And so easily it divides our hearts, doesn't it? Are we in danger, I think the answer to this is yes, are we in danger of losing our ability to relate face to face? Can we actually switch off from the online world? Can we enjoy God's creation? Can we function inside God's patterns, God's boundaries? of work and rest? Or are we just like the smoker who says, well, I could give up? Um, we were at Keswick. Uh, some of you know recently, we saw a friend of mine, good friend Jonathan Norgate, who was a, a missionary in Cambodia. And he and his wife are now back uh, in the UK. And uh, I remember being really struck by a comment in a prayer letter from them a few years ago, because they said one of the things as they, they moved into that different culture and got to know people, one of the things they were learning in their work was the importance of physical presence. And in order to plant roots in a new community, in order to learn a new language, all of these things, they had to take things slowly. They had to be one place one conversation, one person at a time. And the temptation for the missionary, of course, when they, they're writing a prayer letter home is to have loads to say, is to have constant activity. And rather than seeking to justify their existence, the focus was on small steps and living with limits. I think that's so healthy, isn't it? It's absolutely impossible to build deep and meaningful relationships 
if we don't spend prolonged time with one another. It's true in friendship. It's true in marriage. It's true with children. They don't need quality time. They just need time. And it's true in evangelism. It's true in church life. And in the words of one author, we must avoid the blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. There's no end to need, is there, in church life? And yet there's always going to be a limit on how many people we can be with. And there are some things, there are lots of things that only God can do. I mentioned a missionary a moment ago, another missionary, Jim Elliott. And he once told his sister in a letter home, listen to this. This is what he said to her. He said, wherever you are, be all there. And I've often remembered those words. I've often felt challenged by them. Wherever you are, be all there. It's really good advice, isn't it? We're always, we're always thinking the grass is greener. Don't spend all your time wishing you were somewhere else, doing something else, even if it's for God. Do the next thing. The next thing God's put in front of you. Embrace Accept your limits. And learn to love those limits. God made you with limits. God remembers your dust. And God knows there's only so much you can take. And I think this is so countercultural. We live in a world that longs to be limitless, a world that loves the illusion of control. But when we remember we're not omnipresent, when we live the way God intended, and when we do that in a world that is absolutely frazzled and wired, well, we will stand out. So enjoy your access, um, embrace your limits. Here's the, the third, the final thing, feel your need. Feel your need. This is a point about accountability. Access, acceptance, accountability, feel your need. I think the truth that God is omnipresent is it's designed to humble us. And the other side of the access we have, the other side of the coin, is accountability. If God is everywhere, well, God knows all we've done. God has seen it all. And I think David feels this, doesn't he, at the close of Psalm 139. Look at it with me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Before that, look at the way he speaks. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Do I not hate those who hate you? Now, this psalm was read at a Thanksgiving service in St. Paul's Cathedral to mark the Queen's 90th birthday. Uh, but the reading stopped at verse 18. Um, I, think, I don't know what the Queen thought of that. But many people want to silence uh, the closing verses. Uh, to some people, they sound barbaric. And uh, I want to say to you, that, to you tonight, I, I think that's naive. Uh, they remind us that there's evil in God's world. And King David was not a man who lived in a, a kind of sugar-coated world. King David knew that God has enemies and he hates those who hate him. He wants God's judgment to fall. And yet the psalm doesn't end at verse 22, does it? 
Look at the change in verse 23. David knows there's sin in his own heart too. What does he pray? Search me, try me, lead me. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was one of the, the towering kind of intellectual figures in the 20th century. He suffered terribly in the, the communist work camps, the gulags. But with brutal honesty, he once said this, the dividing line between good and evil, that dividing line, it runs straight through the human heart. The dividing line between good and evil, it runs straight through the human heart. Striking, isn't it? A man who'd experienced terrible evil. And he says, I'm evil too. And this psalm, Psalm 139, it reminds us that all of us are accountable to God. All of us to the omnipresent God. All of us need to be forgiven by Him. And that's why he came down. And the amazing thing about our limitless God, he became a human being. He lived with our weakness. He was cursed for our sin. And he was held in place on a cross by nails, wasn't he? And we, have made, we may have spent the whole of our lives running from Him, but He pursues us in love and He welcomes us home. So search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father,